Good afternoon, everyone. Hello. Happy Monday. We'll take your questions in just a moment. But first, uh, last week's African Union announcement of the signing of a cessation of hostilities between the government of Ethiopia and the Tigrayan People's Liberation Front, or TPLF, represents, as we said, a significant step towards peace. We, we again commend the parties for reaching an agreement and applaud the African Union and the governments of Kenya and South Africa for helping to drive this process. The parties are in Nairobi. Uh, in keeping with the provision that the Ethiopian National Defense Fund and the Tigrayan Defense Force uh, would meet within five days to work out the implementation. Also, as provided by the agreement, a hotline has been established between the two senior most commanders. These concrete implementation steps reflect a commitment by both parties to quote unquote silence the guns, but more work remains. We understand the agenda for the Nairobi talks will also include the urgent need to expedite humanitarian assistance and restoration of services for Tigray and adjoining affected regions of Afar and Amhara in accordance with the cessation of hostilities agreement. The talks are being presided over by the AU high-level panel of former presidents of Sanjo and Kenyatta, the AU commission and with participation of Kenyan and South African generals. The observers include the Intergovernmental Inter Authority on Development, or IGAD, and the US represented by our special envoy, Mike Hammer. Our special envoy is remain remaining in the region to support implementation of the Pretoria Agreement. We stand ready to continue to support the parties along, the, uh, along with the international partners on implementation of the agreement. And then finally today, the US Department of State, through the Transnational Organized Crime Rewards Program, announced a reward offer of up to $1 million for information leading to the arrest and or conviction of three Haitian nationals, Lamu Sanju, AKA Joseph Wilson, Jermaine Stevenson, AKA Gaspi, and Vital Om Inosan. On October 16th, 2021, the 400 Mawozo Gang, of which these individuals are members, engaged in a conspiracy to kidnap 16 U.S. Christian missionaries and one Canadian missionary to hold them for ransom. The missionaries and their families were abducted after visiting an orphanage in the town of Gatier, east of Port-au-Prince. The kidnapping victims of the, 12 missionary, uh, of the missionary group included 12 adults and five children. The United States support the efforts of our Haitian law enforcement partners seeking to enforce the rule of law in Haiti and to combat transnational organized crime. Supporting the Haitian people is a whole of government effort. This reward offer complements the U.S. Department of Justice, Justice's announce, announcement of felony indictments against Wilson, Sanju, uh, Sanju and Innocent for their roles in the kidnapping. Currently, all three individuals are fugitive from justice. With that, Matt. Great. Uh, thanks, Ned. Happy Monday. Um, before I get to uh, a question on Russia, I just want to ask real quick, because I don't think you'll have a lot on this, uh, but I just want to uh, make sure. Um, and that is the um, murder of a U.S. aid worker in Baghdad. You're right. We don't have uh, much to offer on this publicly just yet. We're, of course, aware of these reports. We're looking into these reports. Uh, there is a process that we would need to undertake uh, if and when we are in a position to confirm uh, that an America, American has been uh, killed. Uh, we would, of course, first notify the next of kin before uh, making any public comments. So we're still looking into these reports to determine uh, what we can regarding uh, these these allegations. Okay. Well, does, does that mean that you're that, that you don't you, you don't even know if someone has been has, has been killed in the circumstances that were described? There, there's no reason to doubt that uh, someone has been killed, as as the reports indicate. Uh, but we want to be thorough in determining that uh, the victim in this case uh, was, in fact, a U.S. citizen, and, of course, then undertaking any uh, necessary efforts to notify next of kin. Okay. Uh, and then uh, moving on, unless anyone has more on that, uh, I just want to ask you about this um, quote-unquote admission by uh, Mr. Pedroza in Russia that if they have interfered, they will continue to interfere in, in, in U.S. elections. And what, what do you make of it, if, if anything? Well, I suppose his own statements didn't tell us anything we didn't already know. Uh, his bold confession, if anything, uh, appears to be just a manifestation of the impunity that crooks and cronies uh, enjoy under President Putin uh, and the Kremlin. Uh, as you know, we have sanctioned this individual, Yevgeny Prigozhin, uh, since 2018 for his interference in uh, the uh, with our uh, election processes and institutions. Uh, in March of 2018, the Department of the Treasury designated the Internet Research Agency and Prigozhin himself 
Uh, this designation targeted malicious cyber actors, including those involved in interfering with the election uh, process and institutions. Uh, on September 20th of 2019, uh, Treasury, under the auspices of OFAC, also took action against Russian actors that attempted to influence the 2018 midterm elections, including previously designated person uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin, as well as the employees of the Internet Research Agency, which uh, Prigozhin himself finances. In July of this year, uh, we put forward a, a so-called Reward for Justice, or RFJ, uh, seeking information on interference in U.S. elections by uh, the Internet Research Agency, by Prigozhin, uh, and related Russian entities, uh, offering up to $10 million for information on foreign interference in uh, U.S. elections. Uh, we all know, uh, especially today, but every day, uh, the free and fair elections are cornerstone uh, of American society, of American democracy. We won't tolerate interference in our elections regardless of where it comes from. We've demonstrated that uh, not only with our words, but with our deeds. In addition to the sanctions against Prigozhin, against the IRA, uh, this administration has announced uh, sanctions against Russia. We did so in April of 2021 in response not only to Russia's malicious cyber attack, um, in the context of solar winds, in, in the context of what uh, it had done to Mr. Navalny with the chemical weapons attack, what it was doing uh, to Mr. Navalny's supporters, uh, but also in response to its interference uh, in our elections. We've done the same against Iran. Uh, we, we are prepared to do the same against any other uh, state or entity uh, that would seek to interfere in our democratic processes. Uh, okay. You said that in his own statements that it didn't tell, tell you anything that you didn't already know, and then you mentioned uh, how, how, it, uh, how it, it demonstrates an impunity that uh, they acted, but I mean, he's not accused of violating any Russian law. Are you suggesting it, he, it, it demonstrates impunity for him violating U.S. law and that he should fly over here and turn himself in? Is that <laughs> what? Clearly, Matt, these are uh, well, not... This, I, 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 I mean, he, it seems like he's boasting, right? It's um, it, so, but I, I'm not sure how that's a demonstration of his impunity. It is. It is a demonstration of impunity that uh, someone anywhere can boast publicly of interfering in the democratic elections of uh, another sovereign country, uh, and that nothing would happen to him, uh, and far from anything uh, having happened to him, and in terms of the criminal. Uh, justice system, the so-called criminal justice system in Russia. Uh, he is, a, by all accounts, a criminal insider. Uh, he is someone who is uh, a prized associate. Uh, but that, of, but that's of, the point. I mean, do you expect Putin to act, act against him? Uh, of course we don't, ex we, we don't expect President Putin uh, to act against him. We'd like to see uh, the Russian Federation act against someone who so, who so openly boasts uh, about interfering in the elections of a sovereign country. Uh, of course, we would expect that uh, of a responsible law enforcement system, of a responsible government, but of course we know better than to expect that uh, of Russia's side. And then just a clarification. So uh, you said boasting and so on. He could be just, you know, making himself a lot more important than he really is. I mean, are the Russians really involved in this thing? Do you think that he would say this without giving it, being given a green light by Putin, for instance? So I will leave it to my colleagues at the Department of Homeland Security and the Office of the Director of National Intelligence to speak to what the current threat environment looks like. But uh, what I will say is that uh, we know that both the IRA uh, and its benefactor, Prigozhin, uh, have been involved in election interference in the past. Uh, we are very closely watching, the Department of Homeland Security is very closely watching uh, any potential efforts to interfere, uh, whether it's with disinformation or misinformation or otherwise, uh, in our upcoming midterm elections or other democratic processes uh, in this country. So uh, whether everything he has said over the past uh, day or so is completely accurate, uh, that's not something I'm going to weigh in on. But what I will weigh in on is that this is an indiv individual uh, who has and continues to uh, claim to be interfering uh, in our democratic processes, and that's something we take so, seriously. Do you think that this is, you know, maliciously intended right on the eve of the midterm elections to sort to throw some sort of a monkey wrench if they can into this election? Look, I'm not going to ascribe any particular motive to these statements, whether it was boasting, uh, whether it was bragging, whether there was some uh, broader strategic intent. What we do know, and we've spoken to this publicly a number of weeks ago now, is Russia's efforts around the world to interfere in the election and the electoral processes uh, of sovereign countries. 
Uh, we declassified and made public at the time that uh, Russia has invested at least $300 million uh, in these efforts. Its efforts have been well publicized in some instances, including uh, in the context of our elections in 2016. There's uh, an intelligence community assessment that lays that out. There's a public version of that that lays that out uh, in some detail. But uh, Russia's efforts to subvert democratic processes are, of course, not confined to the United States. They're not confined to any one country. Uh, what we will do is to respond and to respond decisively uh, to any country, uh, any actor uh, that seeks to interfere in our elections. Uh, also, on this, uh, on this line, uh, given who he is, uh, is it your assessment that his actions have been sanctioned by President Putin himself? And when you talk about impurity, sanctioned as an authorized? Uh, authorized. Okay. Because we've sanctioned him. Yes. Uh, look, it is it's difficult uh, to say. I think what uh, what is clear is that uh, someone of this stature, someone who is making these sorts of claims. Uh, would not be in a position to do so, going back to Matt's question, uh, if the Kremlin at some level uh, didn't <coughs> approve it. Uh, the lack of action against an individual like this uh, is itself a pretty telling action. Uh, it is uh, an indication that uh, he has at least some degree of tacit permission from uh, senior officials in the Russian government. What we do know uh, about, and this goes back to uh, the publicly released intelligence assessment from uh, a number of years ago now, is that when it comes to Russia's previous interference in our elections, it was approved at the highest levels of the Kremlin. Uh, but again, when it comes to what is the threat we may be facing now from Russia or from any other state actor, uh, that is something that I would refer you to uh, the intelligence community or to DHS. And when you talk about impurity, uh, is the US government willing to sanction uh, President Putin himself? We have sanctioned President Putin himself. Election, uh, in terms of you know, violating uh, interfering with U.S. election process. We, we have sanctioned President Putin himself for the actions he's taken in, in recent months. Uh, of course, uh, I'm not going to preview uh, what might happen in this upcoming midterm election or what could happen uh, going forward, but uh, suffice to say that we will respond and we will respond decisively uh, to any country, to any entity, to any individual uh, that seeks to interfere in our elections. And that's, uh, in terms of uh, his actress, uh, recent months, uh, can I get you comment on the reported talks with the Russians? Are there different camps inside the administration in terms of how to deal with Russia at this point? There is both uh, in this administration and with our European allies uh, a firm recognition uh, of the principle that has animated our efforts since before February 24th, and that is nothing about Ukraine without Ukraine. Uh, that is something that uh, we have all uh, subscribe to. It is something that you've heard uh, from this administration. It's something that you've heard uh, from our partners as well. Uh, more recently, you've heard from the United States and from our partners, including in the G7 statement that was just released at the conclusion of the uh, ministerial in Munster. There was a reference to this in the leader's statement uh, some, some weeks back, uh, that we believe, as do the Ukrainians, in a just peace a just peace that respects the UN Charter's principles of territorial integrity and sovereignty, uh, that would safeguard Ukraine's ability to defend itself in the future, uh, that would ensure Ukraine's recovery, its reconstruction, and would provide for accountability for Russia's uh, assault on Ukraine and its commission of war crimes. Uh, if Russia is ready for that negotiation, it should stop its bombs, it should stop its missiles. It should stop attacking and killing Ukrainian civilians, uh, pursuing infrastructure, including civilian infrastructure. Uh, but of course, the Kremlin is doing the opposite. It is continuing uh, to escalate this war, this war uh, rather than to offer any sort of real signal uh, that it is ready for or open to negotiations. Uh, if Russia wants to negotiate, why then? did it walk away, even if temporarily, from the Black Sea Grant Initiative. Uh, that was perhaps the one forum where Russians and Ukrainians uh, spoke and now speak directly uh, on a daily basis. Uh, if it wants to demonstrate a serious commitment uh, to de-escalation, um, Russia could start by committing to renew uh, this Black Sea Grant Initiative when it comes up uh, for renewal later this month. But 
it is not just us saying this. You've heard this as well from our Ukrainian partners. President Zelensky gave an address over the weekend. He said, quote, we are ready for peace, for a fair and just peace, the formula of which we have voiced many times. The world knows our position. This is respect for the UN Charter, respect for our territorial integrity, uh, respect for our people. He has said a number of times uh, that this war can only end through dialogue and diplomacy. Uh, we feel exactly the same. Our European uh, allies feel exactly the same. Uh, but it is incumbent upon Russia uh, to signal its willingness uh, and its readiness uh, to sit down to engage with the Ukrainians. Uh, instead, the only signal Russia has sent uh, is one of death, is one of destruction, uh, is one of continued brutality. Yeah. Uh, an Italian paper is reporting that NATO and the EU are discussing possible talks with Russia after U Ukraine liberates Kherson. It, can you confirm this, and are you viewing that as a sort of turning point? It, uh, the, uh, the, the notion is that the Ukrainians would begin? Uh, uh, that NATO and the EU are discussing possible talks with Russia after Ukraine. So I, I would have to refer to NATO and to the EU for, for any plans. Uh, they have, but I feel confident in stating, as I just did a, a moment ago, uh, that we are firmly of the belief, NATO is firmly of the belief, and the EU is firmly of the belief that there can be nothing about Ukraine without Ukraine. Uh, so certainly it is not the case that, and again, without speaking for uh, NATO or the EU, but I'm confident in saying that it is not the case that NATO and the EU uh, would separately engage with Russia to determine the future of Ukraine uh, and determine how uh, this conflict ends. Uh, that is only something that Ukraine can do with Russia. Uh, these are decisions that the Ukrainian government uh, is going to have to make as the democratically elected representative of the Ukrainian people. Uh, it is something that President Zelensky has said he is uh, committed to pursuing. Uh, he has said that this war will only end through dialogue and diplomacy. It can't end decisively on the battlefield, it won't end decisively on the battlefield, but ultimately uh, this is going to, be a ha going to have to be a process between Ukraine and Russia. Uh, in the interim, we are going to continue the process uh, that we have had underway since before February 24th, and this is also something we've done in close coordination with the EU uh, and with NATO, and that is to continue providing Ukraine with the security assistance it needs, the economic assistance it needs, uh, and the humanitarian assistance it needs so that when that negotiating table develops, Ukraine will be in the strongest possible position. Nobody wants this war to end more than the Ukrainian people. No one has been more brutalized and battered uh, than the Ukrainian people, of course. So they have every incentive uh, to see this war come to a close. Uh, but what we want to see is that they are in the strongest position, despite what Russia is doing to them day in, day out, to try to weaken them, to, try to break them. And we're going to continue providing our Ukrainian partners with what they need, not only to withstand uh, this aggression, uh, but to emerge uh, strong and capable uh, at the negotiating table. Yeah. Uh, that could go on for a very long time, as you know. Uh, in the meantime, uh, the war is going on. Nobody seems to be winning, uh, uh, despite all the claims that uh, the Ukrainians are making progress, the Russians are going back. But anyway, they're there. They're not going anywhere uh, anytime soon. Um, so you have to be looking at backdoor channels to have some sort of, uh, not necessarily at this moment, negotiations per se, but you have to be looking at other options because this can go on forever. So what do you say to that? There's been contacts. Of course, Jake Sullivan was in Ukraine, in contacts with the Russians. So what, what, uh, under what conditions could uh, uh, you be open to some sort of diplomatic solution? Besides saying that, uh, obviously, Russia stopped the war. It's not going to happen. Well, there seem to be a couple elements to your question. One has to do with the modalities of a negotiation. Uh, two has to do with uh, the timing of any potential uh, negotiation. And three uh, pertains to uh, any uh, contacts uh, on the part of the United States. So um, I'll take those in turn. The first two, uh, really the answer is the same. It is up to the Ukrainians uh, to determine what those negotiations look like. 
Uh, and we're when we're talking about negotiations in this context, uh, I'm referring to negotiations between, it has to be, Russia and Ukraine uh, regarding the end of the war. Uh, it is up to Ukraine to determine who exactly is involved in this process, what precisely uh, this process looks like. Of course, the United States and Ukraine's uh, many partners around the world stand ready to assist and to offer uh, counsel uh, and advice. But ultimately, these are going to have to be decisions that uh, the Ukrainians themselves make. When it comes to the United States, um, again, I want to be very clear. There is no moving. There is no budging uh, from our bottom line position that there is nothing about Ukraine without Ukraine. At the same time, the United States as a responsible country, uh, we have an obligation to maintain channels of communication with Russia. Uh, we have been very clear about this in some instances, in spite of efforts of the Russians to make our diplomatic efforts, including those in Moscow, more difficult. Uh, but we have been um, emphatic in the belief that lines of communication and channels of dialogue are important even in times of tension, but they are especially important in times of conflict. Uh, so we have been very intentional and deliberate about uh, seeing to it that those, that existing lines of communication are not closed. And you've seen us exercise uh, those lines of communication. We don't broadcast uh, every conversation we have, of course, but uh, Secretary Blinken picked up the phone uh, some months ago now because there were issues of great bilateral concern, uh, including the status of Paul Whelan and Brittany Griner, the two wrongfully detained Americans uh, in Russia. He wanted to send a very stark and clear warning uh, to Russia at the time regarding uh, our knowledge of what it uh, planned to do. Uh, more recently, Secretary Austin, uh, Chairman Milley, they've picked up the phones uh, to their counterparts. Those have been the principal level engagements. But the fact is, uh, and, and of course, the White House is, has read out um, a conversation that uh, Jake Sullivan uh, has had uh, with a Russian official uh, a number of months ago. Uh, but the fact is, those are all principal level engagements. We have a functioning embassy in Moscow. Uh, we speak to the Russians via the embassy virtually every day, if not, in fact, every day. Uh, we speak uh, consistently uh, via the, uh, we pass messages via the Russian embassy uh, here in Washington. Uh, so there are a number of ways for us to convey messages of bilateral importance to Russia. And I, I emphasize that word bilateral uh, because we are not discussing with the Russians what a negotiated peace might look like, what the contours of a peace agreement between <laughs> Russia and Ukraine might look like. Uh, we are discussing issues that uh, have a profound importance in our bilateral relationship, whether that is uh, the status of the two wrongfully detained Americans, whether that's the status of our embassy in Moscow, whether that is the imperative that the United States has to send a very clear signal uh, to Russia of the enormous costs of escalation or, God forbid, uh, nuclear use. Uh, those are the types of conversations that we're in a position to have day in, day out. Uh, some of those conversations are routine, are prosaic. Uh, others are uh, perhaps more strategic and significant. Um, but the fact is that we believe it's very important for us to have those conversations. Jim. Thank you. Uh, at the union, Anything else on Russia Ukraine before we uh, yeah. cut? Sure. Um, I'm just wondering if you would, there's been, you know, a lot of conversation about diplomacy and um, when or if the Biden administration will push for that. Um, would you say um, that the Biden administration right now is doing everything that you guys can to urge Russia towards a diplomatic solution? Of course, and, and we're doing that in a number of ways. One is our messaging uh, and the very simple message that this war has to end diplomatically. It has to end through dialogue. The Ukrainians are doing this uh, as well. Uh, consistent with that message is actually what we're doing uh, in terms of our provision of support to the Ukrainians. There is not going to be a decisive victory on the battlefield, yet we have provided billions of dollars in security assistance uh, to Ukraine. It's more than $18 billion uh, since the start of the conflict, since the start of Russia's war uh, on February 24th. We're providing that to our Ukrainian partners so that they can defend themselves uh, against this 
all-out Russian aggression, but so too that they can be in a stronger position on the, at, at the negotiating table when it develops. We see an interconnection between what happens on the battlefield and when, what we're in a position to do to provide the sort of security assistance our Ukrainian partners need to defend themselves on that very battlefield and what ultimately happens at the negotiating table. Same with our economic assistance. President Putin uh, might have thought that he could starve Ukraine into submission, that he could bomb Ukraine into uh, the depths of winter, into darkness. Uh, we have supported our Ukrainian partners with uh, billions of dollars in economic assistance, including direct budgetary support, uh, so that they can have an economically viable country. Uh, they can have a functioning government. Uh, they can provide their citizens with the basic services uh, that they need to do, even while they're under this brutal assault from Russia. So we have signaled both in our in our messaging and our words, but also in our in our actions, including the support to Ukraine, uh, that we believe deeply uh, in the necessity of uh, dialogue and diplomacy. Unfortunately, uh, the Russians have signaled, certainly in their actions, uh, that at the moment they are focused on escalation. Uh, they are not focused on de-escalation. Uh, they are uh, even less so focused on uh, dialogue and genuine diplomacy. Uh, it's our goal to help the Ukrainians uh, shift that, shift that calculus. And just one follow-up, um, there's a line from President Zelensky last month that got some pickup after Washington Post reporting over the weekend, where he said, we're ready for dialogue with Russia, but with another president of Russia. Um, what is the Biden administration's response to that comment? Do you agree with that sentiment? So you're asking about the modalities uh, of a negotiation, and obviously what the, the details of what a uh, negotiation between Russia and Ukraine would look like, uh, that will have to be worked out between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, the Ukrainians will determine uh, who their representatives will be if and when a negotiating table develops. Uh, they will determine uh, those individuals uh, they're willing to speak with. Uh, so we're not going to weigh in on that, but I think what is much more important is what we've heard repeatedly now from President Zelensky. Uh, his fervent belief, something he has repeated in, even in recent days, uh, that this war will be ended through dialogue and diplomacy. But do you think there could be a diplomatic solution without regime change in Russia? Uh, regime change is not our goal. It is uh, not the goal of our Ukrainian partners. Our goal uh, is to bring an end uh, to uh, President Putin's war. It is to uh, bring an end to it, to help the Ukrainians bring an end to it uh, with a just peace, a just peace that reflects the principles of uh, the UN Charter in terms of sovereignty, in terms of territorial integrity, uh, in terms of uh, Ukraine uh, that is um, uh, at peace, that is uh, free, that is stable, that's economically viable, uh, and that's able to defend itself going forward. We just uh, so we're on the same page here. Um, given the report that was just mentioned uh, on the post, can you explicitly say that nothing that the US government has done last week or the weekend? that would suggest that you have been pressuring, advising, recommending Ukrainians to talk to the war criminal Putin? We're not pressuring our Ukrainian partners. Our Ukrainian partners don't need any pressure to incentivize them uh, to see this war come to an end. No one has suffered more than the Ukrainian people. No one wants to see this war end more than the Ukrainian people and the Ukrainian government. Uh, so it is neither our place for us to pressure the Ukrainians nor uh, would we need to do such a thing? They have every incentive. Uh, it is the Russians uh, that are sending a very different signal. Jane. Thank you. Uh, last weekend at the UN uh, Security Council resolution, China and Russia again opposed the uh, adoption of the uh, nations of North Korea. As China and Russia uh, shifted the blame to the United States, what is the next U.S. next step to do? Well, the, the fact is uh, that we have a slew of sanctions uh, imposed against the DPRK. Uh, the United States does. There are a series of UN Security Council resolutions with uh, costs uh, associated with them and, and, and measures associated with them. Uh, and we've called on all UN member states, but especially members of the Security Council, especially members of the Security Council that have uh, a solemn obligation uh, to uphold 
the principles of the UN Charter, the principles of the UN system, uh, the tenets of the international order. Um, unfortunately, there are two members uh, of the Security Council, the two you named, uh, that have consistently shirked their obligations, uh, that have uh, stood in the way uh, of the ability uh, of the international community uh, to impose additional costs, at least through this venue, uh, on the DPRK for its continued and dangerous and destabilizing provocations uh, that it has mount mounted in recent weeks uh, and in recent months. Um, we have condemned the DPRK's most recent ballistic missile launches, including the ICBM launch earlier this month, uh, the reckless launch of a missile that landed dangerously close to the Republic of Korea. Uh, every single one of these launches threatens regional, global peace, uh, threatens regional and global peace and stability and is a violation of numerous UN Security Council resolutions that were unanimously adopted by the Council. Uh, so members, permanent members especially, of the Security Council have a special obligation. Uh, we're especially concerned by the DPRK's increasingly dangerous and, and irresponsible rhetoric, uh, even when so far as to describe its, its recent missile launches and related activities as uh, quote-unquote practice runs for the use of tactical nuclear weapons against uh, the ROK, uh, against the United States uh, as well. Uh, we will seek to continue to impose costs on the DPRK for its dangerous and destabilizing uh, behavior, even as we continue to seek uh, serious and sustained diplomacy with the DPRK. Uh, we've called many times now for the DPRK to abandon uh, its provocative behavior and to engage in that meaningful dialogue that we have uh, put forward. Uh, but our commitment to the defense of our treaty allies, the ROK and Japan, it's ironclad, uh, will continue to work closely with our allies to um, limit the DPRK's ability to advance its unlawful WMD and ballistic missile program, uh, that threatens regional security. Uh, when it comes to the Security Council, we heard from uh, multiple uh, UN Security Council members, including all of the elected members, the 10 elected members of uh, the UN Security Council, um, just how crucial it is to address the advancing threat of the DPRK. Uh, and I call out the statement on the part of the, ele the 10 elected members uh, of the Security Council, uh, because, of course, the two members of, permanent members of the Security Council uh, have so far been silent. They have been unable or un unwilling for various reasons to lend their voices to condemn uh, what is objectively uh, destabilizing and dangerous uh, activity. We'll continue to engage with partners at the Security Council uh, and continue to make the point to them, both in public and in private, that uh, a DPRK that feels that it can act with impunity uh, and faces watered down condemnation from the rest of the international community uh, is not in the interest of China. It's not in the interest uh, of Russia. Uh, it is profoundly against the interests uh, of uh, the global order. But today, a uh, North Korean uh, military commander has released a statement saying it will take a ruthless counter retaliation against the South Korea and the United States. Uh, how did you respond to this? Our, our response is what you've heard from us throughout this series of provocations. Our commitment to the defense and to the security of our treaty allies, Japan and the ROK, uh, in this case is, is ironclad. Uh, we have taken a number of steps uh, when to increase our uh, defense and our deterrence posture, uh, and we'll continue to calibrate uh, our approach and our activities appropriately. Do you think, oh, one quick, uh, do you think uh, North Korea's continued provocation is simply a set of stage for the dialogue with the United States, or do you see it is as an uh, actual crash? Or do we see it as a, what, what was the last actual, part? Actual crash. As an actual crash? Yeah. Oh, threat. Um, uh, look, I would, I would hate to ascribe a motive, uh, and I would hesitate to ascribe a motive to what we're hearing from the DPRK. Uh, there is uh, a pattern that has played out over the course of decades now 
of a period of provocation followed by a period of engagement, uh, whether what we're seeing now will be preceded by uh, a change in course, a change in tone from the DPRK. I think it's impossible uh, to say with any certainty. Uh, what we can do and what we can seek through both punitive measures and through uh, our statements uh, regarding dialogue and diplomacy, we can try to incentivize them in every way we can uh, to come to the table, to engage uh, in practical diplomacy, to uh, make progress towards what is what is the ultimate goal of the United States, of Japan, of the ROK, uh, and that's a complete de denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Yes. Hi, um, thanks. Uh, Xi Jinping is planning to visit Saudi Arabia as the U.S. reevaluates its relations with the kingdom. Could you talk a little bit about how DOS weighs um, China's potential to fill the void in foreign and economic relations with Saudi Arabia as the U.S. reevaluates its relations with the kingdom? These are going to have to be decisions that uh, both the PRC and Saudi Arabia uh, will come to. It's not for us to say uh, what a bilateral relationship between any two countries um, when the United States isn't among those two countries should, should look like. I do understand that, but do you weigh uh, the potential for China to enter into that void as you uh, determine what your future what, what we weigh, what we weigh, look like? What we weigh are our national interests. Uh, and there are a number, there are a multiplicity of interests that we have when it comes to our relationship with Saudi Arabia. There are a multiplicity of interests we have uh, when it comes to the bilateral relationship uh, we have with the PRC. Uh, so ultimately, we weigh our approach towards any particular country uh, in terms of foreign interests. Uh, we look at the implications of deepening relations between any two countries or any uh, grouping of countries. Uh, we look at the implications that might have in terms of our interests. Uh, but ultimately, uh, we are going to pursue a path that is predicated uh, solely on our interests and the values uh, that we bring to our work around the world. Uh, yes. Thank you, Nat. On Bangladesh, millions of people uh, of Bangladesh gathering in rallies in various parts of the country and demanding voting rights under a neutral caretaker government. Rolling Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina warned the opposition if the BNP went super close in the name of anti government movement, then opposition leader Khaled Azia would be sent to jail again as 77 years old former Prime Minister staying her house. In, with a limited access, and according to State Department reports, her imprisonment is a political ploy to remove her from the political process. So, will you urge the opposition leader of Bangladesh immediate release, and what is your comment on that? We put, as you know, democracy and human rights uh, at the center of our relationships around the world, at the center of our uh, foreign policy. We, as such, regularly raise these issues. Uh, with governments around the world, including the government of Bangladesh. We do so both uh, publicly, uh, as I've done uh, from this room a number of times, we do so uh, in our private engagements. Uh, and in doing so, we urge the strengthening uh, of democratic processes and political institutions, adherence to the rule of law, and the protection of human rights and fundamental freedoms throughout uh, Bangladesh for all Bangladeshis. Uh, with respect to the political process and the next election in Bangladesh, uh, we hope for a robust civic participation and the people of Bangladesh ultimately will be able to choose their own government through free and fair elections. Uh, mm -hmm. That is our hope. That is what we continue to uh, support. We urge the government of Bangladesh to create a safe environment for people to peacefully assemble and to voice their concerns, and relatedly for opposition parties to campaign without facing uh, intimidation and repression. Uh, let me, uh, Dylan. Yeah, uh, regarding protests in Iran, uh, late last week at a campaign event, President Biden said, quote, uh, we're going to bring, or we're going to free Iran, uh, in quotes. Uh, could you shed some light on what that means exactly? The president saying we're going to bring, we're going to free Iran. The, the White House has spoken to this. The president was uh, referring to uh, the sentiment we've put forward since the start of these protests, namely uh, expressing our solidarity uh, with the protesters. We've been doing that uh, from the very earliest days uh, of these peaceful demonstrations. Uh, the fact is that Iran, its government, is facing problems that are fundamentally of its own making. Uh, this is, these protests are so powerful uh, because they are fundamentally not about us. They're not about any external actor. 
Uh, they are about the legitimate, they are about the genuine, they're about the heartfelt aspirations of the Iranian people. And the reason these protests have continued uh, is because uh, there is a, a strong sense uh, among the Iranian people that uh, their government is depriving them uh, of their rights, uh, of their aspirations. Uh, the Iranian government would like nothing more for these protests to be about us, uh, for to be able to blame the United States for what they're seeing. But uh, again, uh, the only entity they can blame is, is themselves. Uh, what we're doing is continuing to look for ways uh, to hold the regime accountable and to show our solidarity and to show our support uh, with those across Iran who are peacefully demanding uh, the universal rights that are as much theirs as they are to people around the world. Does it not throw fuel in that fire to some extent that you were referring to of Iran trying to make these protests about the U.S. when the president says that we're going to, implies that we're involved, says we're going to free them, we're going to do something? The, the again, the Iranian regime uh, would like nothing more than for these protests to be about us. We have made very clear, but more importantly, uh, the Iranian people have made very clear uh, that this is a movement that is an expression of their legitimate and their genuine aspirations. Uh, we are, our role in this is to hold accountable uh, those who are responsible for the repression, for the violence, for <laughs> these internet blackouts, uh, and to signal our, our solidarity uh, for the Iranian people in the same way and in similar ways we do it around the world to peaceful to people uh, who are exercising their universal rights. Just one more quick follow-up. He also said the Iranian people are going to free themselves soon. Uh, is, there, is there any indication that you have that there's some impending, uh, impending regime change or shift that we should expect, or is that just an offhand comment? Uh, again, it's going to be up to the Iranian people um, to determine the course of this movement. Uh, I think what has been so impressive to so many people around the world uh, is that this movement has persisted in the face of violence, it's persisted in the face of repression, it's persisted in the face of systematic efforts to deprive the Iranian people of access to information and the ability to communicate with uh, one another. Uh, it, the fact that these protests have continued, uh, again, suggests that uh, this is the widespread and genuine expression uh, of the demands that the Iranian people have for their government. Rather than try to cast aspersions or cast blame on others, uh, the Iranian government should listen to their people. Say. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Very quickly, moving to the Palestinian the Israeli uh, issue. Uh, first of all, has there been any calls between the Secretary of State and the new uh, Prime Minister would be Mr. Netanyahu? So you may have seen that uh, President Biden had an opportunity to speak with uh, <laughs> Mr. Netanyahu today. Uh, so, of course, uh, the president would be the first to speak with uh, the uh, um, with uh, Benjamin Netanyahu to congratulate him as he did today. Right, because uh, I know that the, the Secretary of State spoke to the outgoing Prime Minister. That's why. Uh, uh, of uh, course, uh, former Prime Minister Lapid is uh, someone the Secretary worked with very closely uh, in his capacity as uh, Foreign Minister, as Alternate Prime Minister, and ultimately as Prime Minister. Okay, so let me ask you on the possible makeup of the uh, Israeli government. I mean, there's a great deal of talk about uh, Ben Gavir again, that he might get one of the security ministries responsible for the Palestinian. Uh, what is the U.S. position on this? I mean, I know the common wisdom around town, uh, even from very pro-Israeli think tanks and so on, that it should not be the case. Do you have any position on a, such a choice? So it is uh, early in the process. It's far too early to speculate on the exact composition of the next uh, governing coalition uh, as we uh, wait for this process uh, to play out. Uh, we'll continue to watch this closely, but not going to speculate on a, on a hypothetical at this stage in the process. But, I mean, would, I think the U.S. would the U.S. look okay or look unkindly on such a choice, considering that he's known for his racist view and called for the killing of Palestinians and so on. At one time, they were listed on the terror list in the United States and so on. So do you have any position on such I, I, As you hear from me almost every day, I don't have a position on a hypothetical. Uh, I, I'm not going to speculate. 
Uh, but the point we've also made is that uh, our rock solid partnership uh, with Israel is based on mutual interests and, and shared values. Uh, and it's those shared values that has served as a powerful glue uh, between our two countries uh, over the past more than 60 years now. Uh, it is uh, a commitment to uh, the value of open democratic societies, uh, tolerance, respect for civil society, including minorities, um, and our, ultimately our uh, identities as, as two democracies. I understand that, that always stood, but I remember a case when the United States did not speak to one Israeli minister, Ariel Sharon, for 18 years because of this uh, involvement in the sovereign city of the massacre, for instance. Are we likely to see something like that, that you will deal with the government, you found a way to deal with the government and not deal directly with Mr. Gavir? Uh, of course, Saeed, we will have a rock-solid relationship uh, with Israel. Uh, the president had a warm call with uh, incoming Prime Minister uh, Netanyahu, but I'm just not going to speculate in a hypothetical so early in the process. So if an asteroid were about to crash into the Earth, the good or bad? <laughs> that that seems to uh, ascribe some some. Uh, well, I don't know. I mean, it's a hypothetical, right? It's a hypothetical. <laughs> so it actually might be good. Uh, go ahead, Biden. Uh, I know that the secretary spoke with uh, Palestinian president uh, Palestinian project of Marina about the situation that is just been going to on the handbasket, as you said. So, uh, what is what is your assessment? What are you trying to do to actually mitigate, you know, this uh, very aggressive Israeli behavior in its middle east? We've spoken for some weeks now uh, about the concern regarding increased violence in the West Bank. Uh, we've reemphasized the need for all parties to do everything in their power to de-escalate uh, the situation. Uh, the recent period, is, is, as you know, Saeed, has seen a, a sharp and, and rather alarming increase uh, in Palestinian and Israeli deaths and injuries, uh, including those of, of numerous children. Uh, we continue to emphasize, and this has really been the predicate of our policy, that Israelis and Palestinians uh, deserve to have equal measures of security, of stability, uh, of justice, of dignity, uh, and democracy. Importantly, uh, we have been conveying these messages. We've been doing so publicly, uh, but we've also been doing so privately. And our message has been uh, to Palestinians and to Israelis alike uh, of the vital importance that the parties themselves uh, take urgent action uh, to prevent even greater loss of life. Uh, this is something that uh, we have worked on quietly uh, behind the scenes uh, well before the recent flare-up in violence, uh, but it is something that uh, we've continued to do uh, in the context of this increase in violence. Uh, Michelle. Do you have any information or any comment to a citizen in Baghdad in a kidnapping that point? We, we discussed this at the very start of the briefing. Uh, we're aware of the reports. Uh, there is a, a process that we would need to complete before we were able to uh, confirm anything uh, publicly. Uh, we're looking into those reports, gathering the facts, but I don't have any more to offer at this point. Uh, yes, Luke. On Syria, is there anything you can share about the U.S. delegation visit to al Hol camp this past weekend? Do they offer any additional support to the local authorities there? So I can confirm, as you likely uh, saw, that uh, a U.S. interagency delegation, including State Department officials, visited al Hol uh, to discuss repatriations, assistance, and security needs in northeast Syria uh, with local authorities and, and partners on the ground. Uh, we continue to encourage all countries with nationals in northeast Syria to work with us towards durable solutions. Uh, we believe it's critical that countries of origin repatriate their nationals from, um, repatri repatriate their nationals from and provide assistance to Northeast Syria to prevent a resurgence uh, of ISIS. Um, when it comes to our, our policy, uh, it's remained uh, clear. We believe that repatriation is the only durable solution to the humanitarian and security situation uh, in displaced persons camp camps in Northeast Syria. Uh, and we have continued to work with uh, our partners around the world uh, to help them uh, affect those repatriations to alleviate this, uh, this worsening crisis. One more in the region. Um, at COP27, will the U.S. delegation meet with any of the activists protesting outside, and will human rights be part of the discussions with Egyptian counterparts? So human rights are always part of the discussions in every single relationship we have uh, around the world. 
Uh, when we have engaged with our Egyptian partners in the past, it has always been uh, high on the agenda. Um, we've made the point to the Egyptians that uh, improvements when it comes to uh, issues of, of human rights only serve to strengthen uh, the basis of, of the bilateral relationship. Uh, I have no doubt that uh, human rights will also feature in the discussions leading up to COP uh, between senior U.S. and Egyptian officials. Uh, and while uh, the U.S. delegation is uh, on the ground uh, in Egypt. Can we stay on human rights just for a second? So I, I, as you know, the secretary and the president are headed to Cambodia this, uh, this weekend. Um, back in August when he was there, the secretary raised with Prime Minister Hun Sen the case of this um, Cambodian American human rights activist who's been jailed, Terry Sen. Uh, at the time, he and you both uh, said that uh, she should be freed, as should others who have been unjustly detained. Um, has there been a determination that she has that she is wrongfully detained in Cambodia, and her case been moved from? purely consular also to uh, the SPIHA office, um, or not? And if not, why not? So I'm not aware that there has been any change in categorization of her case. You were right uh, that the secretary did raise uh, uh, Terry Sung uh, with, Hung, uh, with Hun Sen in Cambodia in August. Um, we routinely raise cases of detained Americans. When a U.S. citizen is arrested anywhere, we closely monitor the case. We provide all appropriate consular assistance. Uh, that's what we're doing uh, in this case. Uh, we are providing uh, Terry Sang and, and her family uh, every form of appropriate assistance uh, that we can. Uh, we're aware that she has uh, initiated a hunger strike. Uh, we've been in touch with her and her representatives. We're, uh, again, uh, providing, uh, providing every uh, appropriate service. Uh, when it comes to how we categorize uh, any individual who's detained around the world, any American who's detained around the world, uh, this is a process that doesn't have an ending. Uh, we never come to a final determination that someone is not wrongfully detained. Uh, we are always looking at the information that is available to us to paint the full picture of the totality of the circumstances uh, of a case. Whether a person is deemed to be detained wrongfully or not, we still have an obligation that we fulfill to provide all appropriate consular assistance to that individual and his or her family. Right. The point is, is that both you and the secretary, uh, as well as uh, Samantha Power and Ibu Zaya, all referred to her as unjustly detained previously, and that no longer. Are you saying that there's some difference between unjust, unjustly detained and if, if the question you're asking is about the, the formal process of classifying someone as a wrongful detainee, the process that's laid out uh, in the Levinson Act and, and yes. uh, a policy. I think the argument is that, that her incarceration meets the, the criteria in the Levinson Act. Uh, and if it doesn't, why not? And also, if it doesn't, why would you refer to her as being unjustly detained before and now not? There's been no effort to change our language uh, on this case. We are always well, looking... Can, can you say that she is under... Can, today, can you say that we call on the Cambodian authorities to release her, that she has been unjustly detained? We've engaged very closely, including at high levels, with Cambodian authorities. That's why Secretary Blinken raised it with Hun Sen when we were in Phnom Penh in August. Uh, but we're always looking at the totality of circumstances of any particular case. Uh, but whether an individual is detained wrongfully or whether an individual is uh, <laughs> detained. Uh, we <laughs> provide every appropriate service to that individual so, and their family. So you can't say today that you think that she was unjustly detained? Uh, I'm not in a position to say that. Okay. Why? Can you say why if you had said it before? I, I'm. There has been no effort to shift. Well, there our, obviously has been because you used that language before and now you're refusing to. So there obviously has been an effort to shift it. And they, I'm just wondering why. There, 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 to the best of my knowledge, there, there has not been any change in the status of her case. Well, then what? Then why would you, why would you drop that word, that adverb from the 
from 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 the lines. I, I would have to go back and, and look at precisely what you're referring to, but there, to the best of my knowledge, there has been no change in the status of our case. Well, lastly, do you, do you expect this will be raised by either the secretary or I, I know you can't speak for the president, but do you, do you expect it to be raised by U.S. officials during the during the um, the meetings in, in Phnom Penh? I, I I won't speak for the White House, but. Uh, this is a case that we routinely raise at uh, senior levels, and that will continue. Uh, let me take a final Thank question. Yes. Uh, last week, NSC spokesperson John Kirby said North Korea was trying to send ammunition to Russia. And uh, on last Friday, uh, there was a report that uh, a train was crossing from North Korea to Russia. Uh, have you seen any indication that uh, the train could be... Uh, secret shipment from North Korea to Russia? I'm not in a position to uh, speak in any granular detail about uh, our, uh, any information we have pertaining to that particular shipment. What we are aware of reports of resumed rail traffic uh, between Russia and the DPRK. Uh, we continue to track this issue very closely. Uh, what is true is that multiple UN Security Council resolutions <coughs> um, prohibit UN member states from procuring from the DPRK all arms and related material. Uh, the UN Security Council imposed this prohibition over a decade ago in response to the DPRK's illicit WMD and, and uh, ballistic missile uh, program. So it is an effort. It's a program that we continue to watch very closely. We did declassify last week uh, that the DPRK was uh, seeking to uh, supply Russia uh, with needed security assistance, attempting to disguise uh, those shipments by um, laundering them through uh, third countries, but I'm just not in a position to speak to this particular uh, rail shipment. Uh, well, before you go, sure. can I can I just point out this? This is what you said on June 15th in a statement, a written statement. And I wanted to pull it up so that I had it right, and I could quote it 100%. June 15th, 2022. You heard in your name. We call on Cambodian authorities to release all those unjustly detained, including te uh, Terry Sen, and protect freedoms of expression, association, and peaceful assembly consistent with Cambodia's constitution and its international obligations and commitments. So I, I don't see how you can say that there hasn't been a concerted effort or action to change that determination. Because you won't say it today, but yet you had no no problem, you and the secretary and the others that I mentioned back in, in June. Well, we'll see if we can get you more details. Thank you. Yep. Thanks. The chime minute before you go, because I know you're going to have me. Uh, I unfortunately need to run. I'm sorry. Thanks.